boy. Come busting out, smoking a cigarette, talking loud, and saying nothing. Hoo and I ain't stopped since. Norman Nardini show four. Forty. If you if you take the number four, and you multiply it by ten, what do you get? Four. Forty. <laughs> Fodies. That's what you uh, get when you go to the uh, neighborhood bar. You fody up. Little English, fody up. That'll get you through a Friday night or at least get you started until one of your friends comes over and bells you out with a little shining. <laughs> uh, I get so excited to get with all of y'all. Right now, I'm standing on the Starlight stage in my mind. On my goddamn stage. You know, when I started playing the Starlight, there was no stage. But my beautiful cuz from out west, Johnny Greco, he saw me work and he said, you know what? He said, you know, every bull needs a stage where he can rage. He said, I'm going to send in a professional because I want to see my little bull rage. I want him to stand him up a little bit. Us Italians, we ain't, we ain't the tallest people. But put me on a stage and, ampl God forbid, amplify my voice. Now you got problems. <laughs> now you got to deal with it. Can you deal with it? Well, we're just going to have to see. Hey, uh, we're going to be here for a couple hours. Uh, we're going to be, well, throwing it and showing it. Slapping the meat on the table. And uh, as I like to say uh, to the girls... Darling, you're coming on strong and <laughs> staying on long. Tell a man, do he's a performer. He's gonna put on a little show for you. You know, back in the day when the, the Tigers were all crazy men and they were all falling in and out of love. And I used to always tell them all, I say, hey. Make sure when you're with this girl, she gets the whole show. You know what I mean? I just make. I just. You want to? This isn't uh, hit and split. This is performance. This is an opportunity to slap onto the table who you are, and put the word on the goddamn street about how you might be able to perform. I don't know who else is going to tell you these inside thoughts like me that knows showbiz, like I know showbiz. It's a performance. Bang. Oh. You feel me now? Like, did I say, am I glad to see this? I am. Um, I don't know if you guys saw on the uh, intranet. Um, they had the face... They had a mustache-free face of Moonwalk. Uh, Cheryl Renovato and a buddy of hers, and I can't remember what his name is. I think he lives in Florida. But he's not a guy that I know, but I know her well. Not well, but I mean, I know her, and I like her. And uh, she decided to put on um, this effort to gather interest and support for Moondwog and his establishment, Moondwogs. And uh, and I see, and once she posted it up and started talking about it, you know what I saw? My heart went to flutter because so many people, so many good ass people, just like smiled upon the thought of lifting a finger to help a mustache-free moon dog. I love him without a mustache. You know, when he doesn't have a mustache, you know who he looks like? I'll tell you exactly who he looks like. Art Essa, his father. Uh, I don't know if you ever met Mooney's dad. I went to Moondog's father's funeral. And uh, something extremely impressive happened there. Uh, me and the old lady went. And... Uh, there was 
no shit, a 90 minute to two hour procession, never stopping, of firemen and policemen coming in to show respect for Arthur Esser. They just a kept on a coming. They were down the goddamn street, all waiting their turn to just walk up and smile upon this gentleman, Mooney's father. Um, can you picture what it was like to be Moondog's father? Can you picture Moondog at 12? What an a-hole he had to be. I mean, he's an a-hole now. Uh, and he's learned a lot. So, I mean, can you picture what the, the devil, Harold, the devil inside Moondog when he was 12. Can you imagine the, you know, the depths of his insanity? You know, the thing, I think, I think Moondog's father had to be a little bit like mine. Because my father knew this. And what he knew is that boys are born to screw shit up. That's just how it is. Boys are supposed to make every mistake that can be made uh, all through, all the way up to the time they're 25. Maybe some 17, 18, no. You know, that's what, you know, on paper maybe, but in real life, boys are just meant to screw one thing up after another. And, and the difference between a boy and a man is that, is a boy that actually learned from the mistakes becomes a man. Some folks, did you ever hear the saying, some people never learn? <laughs> well, but some do. And when they do, they gather knowledge. And, 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 and uh, how cool is that, right? But that don't mean they gotta quit screwing shit up. Because what's the fun uh, when, when you get all past all of it? No, no. Let's keep a little boy in the man. But uh, Cheryl put this thing out, and uh, and it just seemed like everybody had such a a warm feeling about Moon Dog and Moon Dogs the club. Which I think I my, did my first day for Mooney in uh, would have been uh, 1989, right around the time when he opened to join up, and. Uh, I didn't really know him. He had come from uh, graffiti. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Harry told me, he said, this guy's got to be all right because... Uh, he slid me a beer after hours. One, one, night, one night, a few years back when Moondog was running graffiti for Tony, uh, Harry was in there and he asked Moondog uh, for a little something to wet his parched lips. And Moondog shuffled him one. And Harry said, you know what? Some bitch is all right. So uh, he was looking forward to the joint and the, uh, but who would have known that Moondogs would still be here? How many bars that we played in 1989 are still here? Let me, let me, make, let me make that question a little tougher. Let me, let me tighten the, the noose on that question by saying this. How many bars are still here? They play original music. Are you kidding me? Playing original music in today's society, and not just today's, but even back in time, is you could have a little bit of something in your pants. You want to be someone that goes out and plays your own music. You better be rocking a little something, dragging it across the floor, to be able to stand in front of an audience and play your own songs. And how about a club, a house for these types of people that come from all over the country? I know uh, I was talking to Harry the other day and we were talking about uh, opening a show at Mooney's for Pete Effin Best. Yeah, Pete. <laughs> Tom, Pete Effin Best, we opened this show for him. And we went out and we just skanked and spanked. 
I remember it because it meant a lot to us to to let these English guys know. When you let me say this to musicians and to people, when these English guys come over and you're playing with them and they start acting around being all English and shit, it's our duty to to make to beat the respect into them <laughs> that we deserve. Because they're walking around with their they're, they're being all acting all English and shit, and it's like okay, we get it, but you know, not now you're here in our house, and you're gonna see how we roll down the hill, and you're gonna see what it's like when you're playing with some guys that know every goddamn trick in the book and ain't afraid to pull none of them. That's who you're dealing with here in Pittsburgh tonight. But. Uh, these are the thoughts that run through my little peanut head. But anyway, we're playing with Pete Best, and it was just hip. You know what I mean? We were also talking about playing with David Lindley. Ah, uh, Dave, nicest cowboy boots I ever saw. Yeah, he had the nicest cowboy boots Harry ever saw. Yeah, blue, Potter blue. Love Potter blue. Meanwhile, David Lindley... Very bit. He was playing by himself, and Harry and I were just playing as a duo. And he wasn't speaking much. In fact, and when I say not much, that means he wasn't speaking at all. Uh, and we're back in the dress room, dragging our asses across, along with Mr. L Lindley. And I'm thinking, I said, "This son of a bitch, you know, hey, you're in town. Say hello. How you doing? You know, how's your ass? How's your old ass doing?" Nothing. So I go over to him and I go like this. I says, hey, David, uh, I says, did you ever run across a guy named Jesse Edwin Davis? And as soon as I said that, Mr. Lindley lit up like a 120-watt bulb. Lit up! And, he, and that fountain just started. And he just started telling Jesse Ed stories and um, talking about how they were great friends and he was one of the last people to see him alive and and it was just made me feel so good to know uh, that someone who I had Jesse Ed Davis was the one guitar player back in the days of when everybody played the guitar he was the one guy that spoke to me in the way that he played it was so clean and so simple and just he was really something and he come up off the Taj Mahal tree which meant a lot to me. And then the Beatles and all them guys started hanging out with him. But the way he played was so simple and it was like, uh, it brought the beauty, the melodic beauty of country music into rock and roll and the, and the, the way he played. And, uh, and I think every all the real musical people that heard him play just knew that he was a cut above. But Lily uh, just went off and uh, started, I think he said they had an apartment together at one time and it was just really cool to know that uh, that he was loved, you know, by the because they were both living in Frisco at the time. But anyway, uh, Bernard Allison, and uh, got to play with him there. Uh, who to me is Bernard is one of the uh, finer, uh, what I call real blues people. You know he. Uh, I mean, there are real blues people whose fathers aren't Luther Allison, but Bernard's father just happens to be Luther Allison, and uh, and it was passed by honest. You know, sometimes you see it. You know, like when you you know, like Steve Earle's son who just passed on, uh, J. T. Earle. He Earle passed on to this boy a high level amount of talent, and the kid had was better than just about everybody else. And um, and that's like kind of the way Bernard is. He's better than just about everybody else. And he and both of those guys got it from their fathers and how cool is it to see that, you know, that be uh, be able to see that in your lifetime. You know, the power of um, the gene, baby, the goddamn gene. Love that. Uh, but Moondog uh, how about um, the Blues Festival? 20 some years. Uh, you know, uh, I, I remember um, a couple of years back, not that many, four or five years ago, uh, Bobby Rush was headlining the Blues Festival. And uh, I told Moondog, I said, dude, I said, I'm a huge Bobby Rush fan. I said, I love this guy. He said, are you serious? 
I says, yeah. I said, I think he's, you know, one of the last guys in his age group left from the original tree in the Blues Garden of Eden. He's one of them, and, and it's real. And he's still vital, and he, and he has his own routine. Whether you like it or you don't, it's a routine, and it's high level. And uh, he said, hey, uh, he said, would you want to introduce him at the Blues Festival? I said, I'd be honored. And so Moondog told Bobby Rush there was some Dago in town that there was a big fan of his that uh, he wanted uh, Bobby's approval for me to introduce him. And Bobby said, I want to meet him. So Mundo called me and says, get out here early because Bobby Rush wants to meet you. So, And if he likes you, then you can introduce him. If not, I got to do it. <laughs> and so he took me backstage to hang out with Bobby Rush. Dude. It was so cool. And he was such a genuine working class. I'm slobber. Such a, <laughs> sniffling and slobber. Um, he was such a working class cat. And it just reassured me that uh, that the working class people and the working class music people are one and the same. You know, they're just about getting shit done. And um, I, got, I actually got to uh, introduce him. Another time at the Blues Fest, I'm here with my old lady. And Moondog says, uh, hey, uh, and I think we were just there watching the show. And Moondog uh, and June, June Dog, June Bug, I call her June Dog, uh, we're backstage and Mooney says to, to, to me and my hillbilly queen, he says, hey, come on backstage, I want you to meet somebody. And we went backstage and Mooney took us in the back room and uh, guess who's sitting there? Keb Mo. He says, sit down, let's hang. And uh, how cool, Keb Mo. The natural descendant of Taj Mahal, the na the tradition, the the but one was passed directly from Taj to Keb Mo. I mean, that's the linkage there is what H U G E. <laughs> They're laughing at me. I'm being blasted. Don't blaff at me. Hey, uh, man, am I glad to see you sons of bitches. You know, uh, every two weeks, it's enough, but it ain't enough. You know, when you're born for this shit, you know, when you're born backstage Broadway, you know, uh, with a, like, like my mother used to say, you know, um, you just sleep between two slices of bread. You're such a ham. Some people are born to ham. You know, ham is a food, and it is a noun, but ham is also a verb. To ham. And if you want to know what to ham means, that's what I've been doing for the last 10 minutes. Uh, oh, and guess what else? When I say ham, when I bought this building in 1981, next door lived an amazing hunky and his name was George but uh, everyone called him Hambone and he was like uh, he was probably you know around 75 back then he lived to be almost 100 but his name was Hambone I think he uh, when he was young he had he got in a fight in the mill and killed somebody and um, very but an amazing cool guy and he was our next door neighbor for the longest time I just wanted to mention him because his name was... And his wife would come out and she'd go, Anybody see Hambone? Do you see Hambone? Where's Hambone? And she was talking about her old man. She was this beautiful, hunky woman. You know, um, these ethnic neighborhoods where you go the good hunks, the good dags, some good Polish. Then you throw, you got to throw your into the mix the Irish. They're always in there. Holding their own. And now you got a neighborhood. And that's what we had in Swiss for all those years ago. It was a pretty great place to hang. Hey, uh, let me get a song going here. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, notes and words. And the fact, the simple fact 
the unbelievable simple fact. What's the charge? Z Rho. Zero. The charge. Notes and words free. When we started doing this shit, uh, I thought I should have a song directly from my heart to the hearts of the people or viewership. And you know what? I told Tom uh, earlier today, we're starting to develop what I would call a highly esteemed viewership. The people that tune in to what we're doing here. These people are a unique people. They're looking for something, well, a little different. <laughs> and you know what we're doing? We're slapping it on the goddamn table! Wrote this for, for all of y'all so that all of y'all will know this. We've got the lights, camera, wonderful studio room, Tom, Harry. We also have the Uncrown King, right? But you know what? It ain't a party until you get here. All these things that we have in the pot. They don't add up to party. Party is when we join together with all of y'all and we snap your girdles, we smack your shit cans, we give you a wet one right across your face. Yeah, that's us. That's when the party is. It's when we're together. When we're engaging, when you're looking at me and go, he's an a-hole. Would you shut up? I thought you were going to play a song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on, man. You know how much I love this shit. <laughs> All right. <coughs> I'm making myself quaff. I'm quaffing over here. I'm going to move aside a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, working it twerking it and jerking it. Joints jumping, pimps and hoes, but there's something missing till you show. It ain't a party till you get here when you arrive. Everybody get turned up The joint come alive You make my blue disappear And ain't a party till you get here Lights are low Bands play Dress to kill People swaying And ain't a party till you get here When you Everybody get turned up The joint come alive You make my blue disappear And ain't a party till you get here And ain't a party till you get here joint, it's too damn hot, but it ain't a party till you get here, when you arrive, everybody get turned up, the joint come alive, you make my blue disappear, and ain't a party till you get here, I hope I've made myself perfectly clear, and ain't a party till you Get it, get over here! 
I won't get with all of y'all. I want to dance with your sister. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, what I say before? Words, music, this shit's free. How? My mind is a simple mind. I'm telling you something you don't know, right? My mind is a a vacant lot. It's a vacant. It's it, it's it's you know like you're like you're in a small town and there's like a and the town isn't doing too well and there's a mess of houses that there's people living in and then there's other houses that are just falling apart and then in between all those houses are vacant lots. One of those vacant lots is my mind. And this vacant lot, Harold, what happened? I can't <coughs> fathom. How many people, what years was the gold rush in California? 1849, 48, somewhere around. Put your teeth in when you talk to me. 1849, <laughs> he says. 1849 was the gold rush. And people were trying, fighting and dying to have the chance that they just might discover gold. Something of value. My vacant lot of a mind tells me that notes and words are more valuable than all the gold in them thar hills. That's what I think. We'll leave it we'll leave it at that. Hey, um uh, I wrote that song to open the show, and I kind of feel like it's working for a minute, like everything's working for a minute. But what I did uh, just a couple days ago, I uh, I opened up my peanut head and I said, you know what, I need to write a song, a song. I like saying song, it seems, makes it seem more significant than song, song. I need to write a song that tells people but here's us. Here's us. See what I mean? Like this. You can see what I'm saying. And uh, I thought if I could write this beautiful song that we could use to close the shows so that people would, just like it ain't a party till you get here, lets people know how important it is to us that they arrive. I need to write a song that tells people how we're all like this and how big of an important idea that is. So the other night I uh, threw this together and I'm going to play it now because I need to play it. Because when you play a song, especially when you, when you first write a song, every time you play it for anybody, you learn something. For the first 20, 25 times you play it, Every time you play it in a different, even if it's for one person, for your mom, when you play it, you learn something about what you're writing and, and where it stands and where you stand with it. So I'm in the process of writing this and I'm gonna play it for you guys. And uh, and, it's, and it's gonna be a closing song for our show if it grows to adulthood. Uh, and it's called and I know it's a little weird. It's called Let There Be. Like that song by the Beatles, it's called Let It Be, that has been over beaten to death by our society. Cool song, cool band. But uh, I just thought enough years had passed and that uh, I could steal a title that was almost that title. And right now I'd like to stick it right in your good ear. Let there be. And if this song makes the grade, we'll be hearing it more often. Okay. You and me, we've got a lot. Though we may have never met 
we're family of humanity and I wish you good as it gets so let there be a light that shines upon you let there be a wind that blows you away let there be prosperity throughout your days trouble free let there be everybody's someone to somebody and everybody's got a right Everybody needs some kind of comfort to get through the night. So let there be a light that shines upon you. Let there be a wind that blows you away. Let there be prosperity. Let there be Let there be a soft place to land Let there be a helping hand Let there be a light that shines upon you Let there be a wind that blows you away, let there be prosperity throughout your dead trouble free, let there be, let there be. I got two hands clapping together. And you know what, a guy like me, I live for that shit. I'd like to bring up a gentleman of distinction. He's the proprietor of Harry's Hideaway. And well, let's just keep that to ourselves. We don't need regular people to know about the Hideaway. If you cover, know what I'm my saying. My cover is blown. <laughs> All right. I just... Harry's cover is blown. Who blew it? <laughs> Norman. He's a blower. Well, he's a shower. He must be a blower. Come on up here, Harry Bottoms. Strap something on. Hey, uh, are you guys glad to... Uh, be alive? Are you glad to be with it? Are you glad to be lifting your leg and just blowing out some hot air? <laughs> Every time... I'm glad it's just air. <laughs> <laughs> you see what Harry said? He's glad it's just air that comes out. Because, you know, you get, we get to a certain age. Uh, what are you going to do? You know, like 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 Moondog used to say, hey, you get a certain age, you can't trust a fart. <laughs> you got to keep it... You can never let it go full loose. You never know. Hey, uh... We love you guys. I can't believe that we're gathering an audience of distinction. I mean, to be gathering an audience to me is even amazing considering the life I've lived. How about my post on Facebook today? It said, I've been blackballed by the evil empire for 25 years. I must be doing something right. <laughs> I'm killing me. Hey, uh, we're going to start off today with a song I wrote with Whitey Clyde Cooper. You know Clyde. You know him, you love him. And we do too. Whitey is the guy responsible 
for taking me down many a dark road. He's not a good person. <laughs> Never was. He's just Harry. He's simply not a good person. Because uh, what would happen is we'd be on these long truck truck drives and in, in the dark when you're you know I can't even hardly drive it in the in the dark anymore. I'm too no. goddamn old. Uh, but we would drive all night, and it would be his job to keep me awake. And so what he by, would do by any means necessary. By any means necessary, <laughs> which is what you do. I was that was part of the rules. Mm -hmm. And but you know what he would do? He would do. There's a word, and I love this word, and I would use it to describe the way he related with me. He the word he would needle me, <laughs> needling. He would needle me and just piss me off and say shit to me that I just wanted to go. Hey, you. Ma <laughs> and that's how he kept me awake, and I never forgot that he's done this. And he and he'd always. Uh, he was proud that we got to the place without being, you know, falling asleep and wrecking. But, uh, he and I wrote this one together and uh, sent it out to all the ladies that might be watching. And let me say to Harry Bottoms and, and Tom that we have some ladies that regularly tune in to the Norman Nardini show. And you know what they do? They want us to, to entertain them. <laughs> oh, doll, you say you need a man to entertain you? You're barking up the right bush. <laughs> there he is. Let's see what you think of this here. Now, when I took you out on the town. I didn't mean to bring you down Cause I was just trying to show you A real good time Now in that little French restaurant You held your head and you are now Cause I was drinking beer Instead of Just like a woman, just like a woman, and just like a woman, and just like a woman, she really blow your mind. So when I took you to the movie show, said you really, really wanna go, but when the curtain went up, you said you changed your mind. Then you I told you all the money that I spent was worth every cent. You said, wait a minute, baby, I'm worth twice the price. Now ain't that just like a woman? Ain't just like a woman? Ain't that just like a woman? Ain't that just like a woman? Ain't that just like a woman? She really blow your mind.
<laughs> oh! Just like a woman. You know what, uh, ladies love outlaws. Waylon said that years ago. How manful was a Wailing Jennings? You know, his son, Shooter, uh, turned out to be a pretty cool artist. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He had a song, he had a song a few years back, and it was called <coughs> Tangled Up Roses. It was about his relationship. It was like Tangled Up Roses. And it was a killer tune. It was just like a massive song. You know, there's so many great uh, country or Americana artists uh, nowadays in uh not many of them get the pop country radio. That they're not really looking for the, uh, the the artist building type situation like it was when we were young. You know, a record company would build an artist and let an artist develop and let an artist be an artist. You know, nowadays it's it's hit it and split it and but that but that don't mean the artist ain't there. They're there. And, and you know what? When the pan when the pandini's over. Shit going to open up. Why? Why? All kind of people are going to be coming out and whooping it on you. Uh, you know, we were... T I always talk about... Uh, well, Harry and I, when we, when we purchased a few years back, we made a purchase. Uh, neither, you know, we've both been musicians our whole lives. We, we, you know, where, where are we going? But what we did, we took, Harry, you know, worked at the graveyard and me. I did a few things I shouldn't have done. And I had a few good dollars. And um, and Harry and I went in and we purchased the original filter, the liver of Freddie Fender. We purchased it uh, on the intranet. And uh, and it took all my savings and all of Harry's savings. And uh, we... we Went down to Austin, Texas, picked it up, and drove it back very carefully in a Winnebago. I just saying, well, I was saying the uh, word. Win what well, great word, right? Uh, Winnebago. Winnebago. If I was an Indian, I would have been in the Winnebago tribe. <laughs> I would have been. But when we got Freddie's liver, I'm taking a look over here. I like to show you guys the case that we carry Freddie Fender's liver in, because we keep it with us all the time. Because you never know when, when a drinking uh, pandemic might break out and somebody might need some liver reinforcement. So that's what we use it for. But I'm going to show you the case. And Oh, I guess it's... it's you know what? It, it's, it's a mess and it's, in, it's hidden behind the other cases, so I can't do it. But uh, when I'm, I'm speaking of Freddie... It's recharging. Fe <laughs> <laughs> said, we have it plugged in. You know, there, we have an, it has an electric socket on it. Every once when we plug it in, it recharges. It's, a, it's like a test. It's an electrolysis. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and it, it really helps the liver uh, maintain the maintenance of the liver. Yeah, that's very very important. And the fermentation of the liver cells keeps it pink. Wait, in this case, it wasn't so pink. <laughs> what am I doing talking about liver now? <laughs> There's a guy's taking over that knows a little something about liver work. <laughs> Hey, give me a good back of engine and I'll start talking. Hey, um, this song was written because of um, my love uh, for Tex-Mex music and for uh, Freddie Fender, Doug Solm, and uh, Blackwee Manny's, uh, Augie Myers, and just that whole Tex-Mex vibration. You know, Butch Hancock, or one of the writers they used, Joe Ely, you know, all them cats down there. Those, I mean... Texas ain't just where they grow blues guitar players, if you know what I'm saying. And it ain't just where they grow great songwriters. Uh, what a great, what a great uh, place where, where amazing shit happens, Texas. I, you know, I never spent enough time there. I did sleep on a shrimp boat a couple nights back in the 70s. Dying, well, why are you so uh, short? You snuck right in. I, I, you know, I, snuck, I was with Fish when we did oh, it. Okay. Frank, the bead man was there. Can you picture being in Texas with the bead man? Uh, no, without going left to go like this. Let me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, young, beautiful. Let's play this song that was influenced by my love for the Tex-Mex music. And it ha ended up becoming 
my mom's favorite Norman song. And uh, that wasn't intended on my part. It just, uh, she just liked what was this song was about. We're gonna have a, a little bit of a freakish thing occur during the performance of this uh, number. Um, we'll talk about it after the performance. <coughs> but if you hear a new sound livening up the gumbo at the Norman Nardini show, mm -hmm. we'll just snap a girdle and slap your grandma. Guitars, this one. This uh, number was on the uh, wonderful, uh, this old train record, which came out in like 89 or 90. And uh, I guess I had developed my love for uh, that stuff all the way back then. If there's anybody out there that loves Tex-Mex music, and that loves the happy sound of a Texican polka, and you know what I'm talking about when I say it. And all I can say is, if you've got the dinero, I'll pull my money. <laughs> Chanel. <laughs> Gentlemen, feel me now? Hit me. You feel that? my time doing the things that I love. Say you only live once, but that's enough. Play it, Augie! If you do all the things you want to do, you are the one when it's over. My mind to take my time and be strong. You say it only gets better, but better than what? Then you realize your fantasies have just begun when it's over. I know I'll be standing when it's over and it's Personal. Yes, we did. Aggie Myers. Right here. <laughs> yes, we did. Adding to the 
Mexicali feel of a simple number. And it just felt so simply wonderful. When it's over, said, and done, and then that cheesy organ <laughs> becomes uh, phenomenal when placed in the right type of music. It, it adds to the cheer and adds to the joy of these uh, wonderful uh, dishes of music that these Tex-Mex uh, purveyors they bring because they know how to make that feel and then they know how to make it feel good. Man, we're glad to have you guys with us. We're gonna do some shit today. I mean some stuff. <laughs> uh, now what we're gonna try here is this uh number we you know what the cool thing about the show is here? Is that you guys, you hunchers, munchers, late for lunchers, whatever, um, all of y'all, you can watch music coming to life. It isn't just the wonderful entertainment that we're giving you. <laughs> we're opening the door to show you how a song is born, how a song can develop, how it can change, how... Uh, how a song um, comes to be what it becomes, and uh, that we're we're not afraid to uh, do that here on the Norman Nardini show. It's part of what we're doing, is letting you guys become a part of these songs as they're being developed. <laughs> Anybody else doing that anywhere? I want to know. I'd love to watch someone else see what they're bringing, what they're dropping in their pants. If, if how much how much balls do you have? How much can you expose the process of birthing a number, a wonderful number? Hey, <laughs> and don't tell me about Latin lovers. You know they've got about a billion people over in China. They must know a little something about loving. <laughs> mm. That's a racetrack, my line that I love with all my heart. We're gonna do Racetrack Mike's song. Uh, it's called One Car Funeral. Uh, we're just developing it and building it into a, uh, a nugget. And I uh, hope you guys like it. And, and thanks for being a part of watching us do this as we build a piece of music. Hopefully, we keep this shit going. We start adding another guy or two here or there, and you know, things start. You know, we start doing more things, and uh, y'all can watch more things develop. And that's entertainment. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Entertain? Are you entertaining? I'm looking into this camera, and I'm daring any of you sons of bitches out there to think for only a second. That all my heart and soul might not be into this shit. Huh. I dare you to think it isn't. Because I'll come right over there, give you a boot right in your shit, Ken. Hey, uh, we're going to send a song out to the memory of the late, great Racetrack Mike. And to all our friends in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Oh, to yeah. George Beckett. George. King. king George. King. You say our king. king. You say king and smile. No, that's our, our king. That's right. Uh, Tommy Young. Oh, Tommy. How about that Mick? That happy face son of a bitch. I'll name? give him a goddamn... How about Frankie Ravisher? Who's the guy? Frankie Ravisher is the guy that turned me on to racetrack Mike. He's the guy that knew Mike that he said, I can't wait till Mike gets to town so that you can meet him. Because a guy like you needs to study on this guy. Because you study what? Character. You see, character is what's up. Character is what a man needs. And let me say this. If you're a young person and you're watching the show today, let me tell you a little something. Important. If you're a, pers if you're a young man in today's world, develop character and personality and the ability to listen to others and the ability to reach others 
face to fudge. Because what's happening is your competition, in other words, other young men and boys, they aren't learning the skills. They're looking at their goddamn computers. They're making their textings to their little friends. But the, the spoken word, the character of a man, his delivery, what he's got in his shorts, these are the things that will separate in 50 years. Harry and I will be like this here. But these young bucks are going to be out in the world competing for what it is. So young guys, get your noses away from your little phones and your computes and all this bullshit. <laughs> Develop character. A presentation of a when you walk into a room, hey, I'm here. You, This is something that a man can do. You know where I learned it from? My Uncle Larry. Because when he walked in the room, every son of a bitch in that room, Larry's here. And they had all their attention without saying a word because he had proven to them that he was the boy. Racetrack Mike had the same thing going for himself. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. <laughs> We shrank through the barroom like an actor on a stage. He held us all captive with the things he'd say. Tall tales of Cleopatra and the Roman Empire. We would buy drinks to fuel the fire. Cigarette dangling, and whiskey on his breath. He'd be shouting about some guinea joint where everything was red. Rave track Mike was easy to like, but hard to get to know. He'd say, Bums like me were gone with the breeze, just a one cup. Mike followed the ponies from Jersey to FLA. And he could spot a sucker. You know why, right? Oh, yeah. There's one born every day. There's days he'd make a killing, but they were few and far. But he never had a span of nickel when we was at the bar. Talk about New Orleans, he'd say the place where jazz was born. Just drinking in a speakeasy and in walks lean a horn. track Mike was easy to like, but ain't nobody ever got close. He'd say, bums like me were gone with the breeze, just a one cup on Everyone give the thumbs up when he walks through the door. They don't make out like him anymore. They talk about Sinatra and some money that he owed to a wise guy named a Skinny. Then he say, How about one for the road? Now, all that's left is legend. Racetrack bum steel tail Bought this tall mick from Beantown Conned his way out of hell His voice rang through the heavens Like an actor on a stage He held the angels captive On his judgment day Racetrack Mike was so easy to like He just walked through heaven's door Didn't seem to mind He left no friends behind At a one-car funeral A one-car funeral
sung to the happy polka beat. Oh! <laughs> Racetrack Mike was so easy to like, he just walked through heaven's door. Didn't seem to mind that he left no friends behind at a one-car funeral. Damn! You know what I say about that? Love it. A little Heisman going there. <laughs> I threw a Heisman at you. <laughs> yeah. You know, me and you old lady, we watch uh, <coughs> Mountaineer football. Mm, mm. She's hillbilly. And uh, we watch Mountaineer football games mm. in football season. Saturday afternoons when the ears are on, we're all weird up. <laughs> it's all weird up, right? You know, we used to play down in Morgantown a lot. Back in the 90s, we had like a seven or eight, ten year period. Yeah. We were down there once a month almost. <clears throat> and our buddy used to bring us down there. He was from Greene County. His name was Bobby Moore. Mm -hmm. And he's gone now. But he was one of the coolest, <laughs> most amazing party friends we ever had. He could hang Ooh. till the sun come up and then some. <laughs> That's the kind of guys I like. Yeah. We're throwing it till the sun comes up. What about sleeping? What about it? You don't, know what I mean? I don't do it. <laughs> that shit will kill you, you know? That sleep. That's right. Uh, <laughs> one car funeral. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to strap a different guitar on. But while I'm there, maybe I have something I could... Say, uh, I want to say this. I don't know if you guys knew this, but I'm I'm thinking about investing in a strip mall. I told Harry about this earlier. He laughed. I don't know why, because uh, I was dead serious. I'm thinking about you know everybody's in therapy for some shit now. Every you know everybody's got problems. You know that and and everybody and, there's, and support groups are what's up. That's how people are getting through their struggles. You know. And as soon as this pandemic is over, you know, that, that's when I'm going to have this strip mall. And I'm going to only rent it out to different therapy groups. And the first group, it'll be like, there'll, there'll be like seven or eight uh, little shops in a little strip mall. I don't know where it'll be. Probably Monroeville. Everything's in Monroeville. And the first, the, the most, the busiest uh, support group will be men who love horse. I mean, that, you know, that's going to be, I've been talking to them already. <laughs> They're interested in my biggest space. And there's, there's the one I'll be going to called the uh, Men Who Love Chihuahuas. And then there's one that's, it's like a subgroup. And I think I'm the only person that might qualify for this group. I heard there was another kid in Ohio, though, that might come in for the meetings. And it would be a support group for men whose fathers ate Fruit Loops. <laughs> You know, there's, there'll only be two of us in that group, but I think we'll get more work done, you know, because we can relate to each yeah, other and talk true. about the difficulties that we've had coming to terms with, you know, these... The fruit loops. The circumstance of it all. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, my last call, just before I left the house, I got a call from uh, a support group that's interested in my small, uh, in a smaller space. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, th their name is, uh, Men who love women, who hate men, um, and that I think that's going to do well too. So, so the good thing is, I'm not going to have to worry about getting my rent in because everybody's so effed up nowadays. They're going to find a re they're going to need treatment for some shit, and you know what I'm going to be there doing, lining my silk pockets with their dough. That's my evil plan. Yeah, it's the evil plan. I have an evil plan, cause. <laughs> Uh, I said we're going to play a song. Nuh-uh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's all okay here. <laughs> so what do you think you're saving now? Yeah. Remember when Edgar G. Robinson was in like the Ten Commandments or something? Do you remember that, Tom? Then he's going, yeah. What do you think you're saving now? Yeah. <laughs> How great was that? You know, my Aunt Rose... My Aunt Rose, my Uncle Carl, my mother's brother, 
his wife Rose loved Joel Brenner. Oh. I don't know why I brought that up, but I guess Edgar G. Robinson and all those uh, masculine figures from that time. The Who masculine. Was Ramsey's. Ramsey's. Ramsey's, yes. Mm. And uh, was he? Was that Liz Taylor? Liz, no, no, that no. wasn't. No, that was. Um... You know, I mentioned Liz Taylor to. Uh, Racetrack Mike, you know what he said? Not that douchebag! <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Not that douchebag! It was like he had no respect for it whatsoever. It was like, dude, you're, how do you say that about Liz Taylor? Man, come on. She was something else in any man's world. <laughs> hey, uh, what did I say? I don't know. Oh, okay. Wasn't Yul Brenner Ramsey's? Yeah, yeah, that's All what right. he just said. And he was great in that, right? Mm -hmm. So let it be written, so let it be done. I like talking like that. <laughs> and, so sh and so it shall be. I like talking smart. That's a smart talker. That's it. Racetrack Mike's, Mike's friend, Rip. Hmm. He used to say it like this. <laughs> oh, wrong tuning. He used to say... Norman, talk smart like me. Talk smart. He says, you don't talk smart. You know, he says, talk smart like me. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, Rip and Mike, both lifelong racetrack bums, were both very well read. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would sit at the bar smoking cigarettes and drinking and reading classics, Shakespeare and all mm -hmm. these amazing uh, literary... In between, right? Between racing forms. <laughs> in between racing forms and entertaining the drunks that might buy them a pack of cigarettes or that would buy, put a couple drinks on the bar. He used to always say, put a little something on the bar besides your elbows, Norman. <laughs> yeah. uh, man, put some money on the bar. You want to sit here beside me? I want to see if you got any money. Because that's how he evaluated, that's how he thought of life. You put your money up when you walk in a room. You show what you got. I mean, he had a whole... His value system was that of someone from another time and from a underground way of thinking and living. Uh, uh, he remind you know, sometimes I think of myself what I do, this shit. I almost think of myself as like a con artist because what I'm trying to do is trick people into paying attention. And that's what Racetrack Mike did. He would trick people into paying attention to him and then he would tell them is, here was, here's what his gaff was, and this is so great. He would see somebody that looked green and didn't belong at the track, and he would go up to him and just start buddying him up and say he worked there and stuff. And then he would say, hey, he says, he says hey, uh, you know, we don't know each other very well. He says, but I want to tell you something. He says, I was just back, you know, with the ponies, and I got word that so-and-so was sick and so-and-so was here, and this, and this horse is, is, is uh, you know, in the prime of his life, and it's, it won its last two races, and it's a shoe-in, and this horse is going to win the seventh race. And I know that because I've been hanging in the back room and, and I can tell you that for a fact. And the guy says, um, well, which horse is it? He says, why would I tell you? <laughs> and, and then he says, he says, listen. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll tell you the horse. He says, but you have to promise to bet, you know, $200 on it. And, and that pays $600 and out of that $600, I want $150. I want $200 because I'm giving you the horse. <laughs> and that's what he that's how he made his living. And people certain people would go, "Okay, I'll do it." And everyone and most of the time they'd lose, but every once in a while they would win. Mm -hmm. And that was a life. And that's why he was so sharp because he had to because he was selling His hustle. His hustle was total bullshit. But he, he made it seem like he was doing you a favor. That's powerful. Day is way around the bend. So
so I borrowed a $20 bill from a friend. Now he said, I got you covered just this one time. I hit a nickel coming in a dime. I hit a little something stashed away by this poker machine star begging me to play now I'm at the bottom of a hole too deep to climb hey I hit a nickel coming in a line I hit a nickel I hit a nickel cause it ain't a dime I hit a nickel cause it ain't a dime Y'all know the way that I be living It's a crime It's a crime I hit a nickel cause it ain't a dime cities they don't say gum band they say a rubber band it's a gum band Pittsburgh baby I hate a nickel because it ain't a dime how y'all how how y'all are remember the uh, Cajun cook used to say that <laughs> yeah. Justine what was his name Tom the Cajun cook back in the 80s uh, yeah. Justine. Justin Wilson. Justin Wilson. Justin yeah. Wilson. How y'all are? Who was hipper than him? You know, a lot of people think Boxcar Willie was, you know, some big. Sh well, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but Harry and Boxcar Willie, they partied together. They hung together. Hobo conventions. Hobo. They went to the fuck. They went to the hobo <laughs> conventions in Cleveland. <laughs> Eerie. You know. You know the hobo conventions. Uh, like regular people that they don't let regular people win you gotta you know what you gotta have character 
You got to have a can of beans and a spoon. At least a, plastic. a can. Of, well, you had to have definitely had to have a can of beans and a spoon. Plastic. Preferably. And but you also had to have character in your face. You know, you had to have lines and you had to have uh, anguish. You know, when you opened your mouth, it had you had to show that you were something like like racetrack, racetrack Mike, like Rip. These guys would open their mouth, and you knew hmm. they were there, and you know that you know you knew they were there because you knew that they had been somewhere else. Okay, I'm talking about Harry, and you know he. The first time he told me, he says, he says, Dookie, he says, you know, um, he says, me, you know, he says, me and Willie, he says, he says I took a greyhound up up the cliff, and I walked to the. I walked to the train yards where where the gang was gathering. And Willie and I sat, we drank, picked guitars, ukuleles, sang country songs. And they sang, uh, he said that Willie sang, uh, I'm lying here with Linda on my mind. Mm. Conway. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard I'm lying here with Linda on my mind. Tom, do you know it? Oh, yeah. That's some heavy shit. I mean, that's some country music, you know, uh, you know, the girl with them tight fitting jeans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you laugh, you think that's funny shit, but you know, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's right funny there. and it's cute, it's but you know what, to a man, a girl with some tight fitting jeans, you know what that is, that's everything, just to see it walk in the room, just to know that it's there. Just to know that someone's enjoying it. <laughs> but uh, Harry said that uh, him and Willie, they jumped a rail car and drove from Cleveland to Seattle, Tom. To Seattle, stopping at uh, points along the way and getting together with old friends, bobos and hobos and hoodoos and... All these um, who don'ts and who don'ts. <laughs> well, we don't like to hang out with those guys. No, we don't. They make us look bad. We got rid of them pretty quick. But uh, and they just didn't. You know what they did every day? They enjoyed. And you know how much money they had? Not a dime in their pockets. They didn't need it because they were just living in the moment. This was years ago, back in the eighties, when Harry and Willie were running together. And now Harry, you know, he's a unique individual. And uh, recently, I've been hearing some shit. Uh-oh. I'm hearing shit. Are you hearing? You know what, kind, you know what I hear? What do you hear? Shit. Oh, I can't figure it out. I hear it. You hear it. And, uh, and I've been hearing that Harry's see. been running uh, a little something down. He's got a... Uh, hideaway. Where he goes, and a few... Uh, choice. We have our AA meetings there, our Assholes Anonymous Club. <laughs> it's right next. You know what? <laughs> That's my strip mall. <laughs> Funny you should bring that up because I, I have one storefront <laughs> left at my strip mall. My strip mall for broken down men. There That's what it'll be called. The strip, you know, broken, the boulevard of broken men. <laughs> That's, it'll be the strip mall. Mm -hmm. Tom likes that. Uh, so anyway, I've been hearing this shit about Harry running Donnie's games and uh, they're living large over there. Just a bunch of bucks <clears throat> getting in and um, living large. And I heard the, sh heard the stories and then I thought, you know, um, sometimes songs just start coming out of your face. You just say the words and you're washing the dishes, you know, and then and, and like a whole verse comes. And that's kind of what happened with this. And uh, it's a thing called Harry's Hideaway. It was just written. Uh, it ain't even done written. Oh, and once again, a really cool thing about the show here. Dropping the, dropping it on the table. Uh, Playing a song before it's done. Playing a song that, that ain't even, you know, it's eight days old, ten days old. Um, and maybe the next time you hear it, it'll have some different words and different parts. Or maybe even a different groove, whatever. But that's fun. And uh, 
let's do this first version of this brand new hunk of meat called Harry's Hideaway that, meat hunk. <laughs> that we don't really have any idea how it goes too much. But we're gonna um, whoop it on you and see what you think of it. It's a little piece called Harry's Hideaway. Uh, it's in the process. One, two, three. Where the boys go to play in the middle of the day. Somebody gonna bring some shine. If you grow a pair, I can take you there. Don't tell y'all, old lady won't tell mine. Have a holiday at Harry's Hideaway. When you walk through the door, best be ready to pour a little something in the Harry's cup. And it shouts hallelujah, man. That'll do you when Ronnie starts a rolling one up. Yeah, have a holiday at Harry's Hideaway. You know, if Larry was here, mm. he'd probably want to play his goddamn flute to it. I was it. just thinking that. He'd probably want to flute it up. He might get, you know, he could, we could do that. I'd prefer to hear a tenor and baritone sax oh, I'd love it. wailing, yeah, the wailing, moaning in pain. I like the baritone. Baritini. Yeah. If I played a baritone sax, it would be a baritini. And if I played a baritone sax, it would have to have a little stand and it would have to be on wheels mm -hmm. so I could like I a, wouldn't even strap it on I'd just like stand behind it you're like Be a Swiss guy with them elk horns <laughs> yes <laughs> like what Ricola yeah, that's exactly right that's exactly right you know we used to live up in um, the Jersey area and we used to go into New York City a lot <laughs> we used to play at uh, Kenny's Castaways yeah. oh Kenny's you know who I met at Kenny's Castaways um Somebody who, uh, of great distinction, somebody who had killer musician and a killer distinctive singer, one of the most distinctive singers of our generation, Rick Effin Danko. Oh, yeah. I met him at Kenny's Castaways. And uh, how great was he? Passed on a few years back. But his singing voice... He was the high falsetto voice of the yeah. band. And and he was also the biggest, lunkiest guy in the band, and he had the highest, littlest voice. And it was but he was such a um, such a musical guy and such a musical bass player. Yeah, he was. You know, he was just very musical and well the whole band was I remember in nineteen sixty nine, I believe it was, when the Brown band album came out. I was living in Squirrel Hill. And when that album came out, I studied that shit 
like a bitch. Like a bitch, I was on it. Uh, and then I went back and studied uh, and got the music from Big Pink album and pulled its pants down and saw what it had in its shorts. So I was 17, I was like 18, 19 years old and I was studying those albums compulsively. I didn't know uh, that the life I was gonna live was would be a life of depravity. <laughs> I said depravity. That's a great word, right? Yeah. Depravity. Uh, whatever, what the hell am I talking about? I don't know. I wanna get with all of y'all. How about that song, Harry's Hideaway? We're gonna build that into something. There's gonna be a couple more verses probably, and uh, you know, be you know, be nice on that is uh, put some little percussion. You know, who, you know who um, used percussion and rhythm in a great way? Who? War. Oh yeah. War. Yeah, what is it good for? That was Edwin Starr, but I mean uh, War. Oh. The band. Oh, the band War. This cool kid was a friend of mine. Oh. <laughs> How about one of the greatest songs of all time? Slipping. Slipping into darkness. Tom knows. Yeah. Slipping into darkness is so effing hip. Um, I was. You know, War didn't have a stand up lead singer. Um, they had a couple, three guys in the band that played instruments and also sang. And they were really like a lot of great bands. A lot of great bands are neighborhoodish. A lot of great bands are, uh, you know, like a guy and his cousin and their two neighbors and, you know, and sometimes, you know, that, that closeness and that uh, war had that thing. It was, it was like a family. And um, mm -hmm. it was really hip. Really, you know who I was thinking about the other day too was a, a group that doesn't get anywhere near the respect it should. Redbone. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, come hey. and get your love. Hey. What? What's the matter with you? Yeah, and they, that was four American Indians. Yeah. And these guys, they had a pop record that was almost nonsensical, but when you study the record and you really listen to it, you realize these guys, it wasn't a nonsensical piece of music. It was a the lead singer who played guitar, Lolly, and his brother who played bass were two of the main studio calls and gig calls that Leon Russell made. Uh -huh. They were two of his main musicians in LA back in the 70s. So these guys weren't just some bullshit record I mean they they were uh, like a family act that had soul and had character and, and they played together naturally because they were they drank the same water because I'll come right to, and I'll give you a red bone those cats were doing something man they really was a great like war another bands from the 70s they were high level Cats, man. That's why people used to talk when we were young. People were people were cats. <laughs> you know, there's this one guy when we were me and a B man used to hang out in the streets around this town here. We meet the, all these old jazz musicians. They'd be smoking cigarettes. They'd be all effed up, boozed out. And then one, I remember this one guy. He said he goes like this. He goes, he goes, hey guys. He goes, I'm an elderly. I'm an elderly cat. He was like thirty. <laughs> He's just like, I'm an elderly cat, man. He was like a jazz bow. Yeah. Oh, was, and B, me and B would always talk about it. Half an hour. Oh, we have a half hour to play? Half an hour. How much do we love you? Uh, Harry and I are going to play a song that I wrote uh, last year, probably about this time. Right around this time. Mm. This song's birthday is uh, in this neighborhood. Because I remember the first times we played it, we played it at Dalif. And Beaner. And Beaner. Mm. Uh, which is a great, you know what, oh, that, Tom, we saw you there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a killer thing down in the strip of Pittsburgh and what they do. Uh, Coffee and cigars. Coffee. 
and cigars, cigars and bring right. your own hoochie and uh, really cool yeah. we played there one day and guess who was sitting in front of us Jack Lambert's son mm. was watching us work and uh, it was cool mm. he seemed like a really good kid too he wasn't like he's not like me he hadn't lost his soul or anything. Yeah, Island Jim's got the best cigars down there I've ever had in my life. Harry's shouting out Island Jim, baby. Yeah, there you go. How about some Island Jim? Good stuff down there. How about my boy Whitey? Oh, hell yeah. We'll clean you He's right in up. cahoots with Island Jim, the two of them. <laughs> they're no goddamn good, the two of them. You put them together. Ain't in, maybe on their own they're good, but the two of them together, it's no goddamn good. Watch out. Glenn's in there, too, now. Remember Big Glenn? I haven't seen Glenn in... Boy, I mi you know, I missed that whole scene of us hanging there. That was so much fun. It was. <coughs> Sherry Richards used to come down. Remember? Mm-hmm. Come down. To yeah, she has a rugged voice like a Sherry Richards. <laughs> when Sherry Richards laughs, <laughs> she laughs like some... Like a, a middle-aged man bar drunk. <laughs> 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 Nothing greater than being around a girl that laughs like that. Let me just say it's exhilarating. Uh, wrote this song. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain it. It, the hook of the song. I was really good at being young. I, I, I might have started off. I was really good at being dumb when I started writing it. <laughs> Uh, and but this song just came real quick and easy and uh, see if you like it. And, and I think people did. As soon as we started doing it, it seemed like it got uh, some nice play from the uh, folks in attendance. <coughs> whenever we would hit it, mm -hmm. Starlight. It got some juice at the Starlight as well. It's a song called Young and Harry right now. And I are gonna, you know what? Whoop it on you. Whip it on me, baby. Whip it on me. One, two, three. By the Golden Gate When we stuck on a thumb Back in 68 Got arrested in Ohio On the interstate Never made the scene At Ashbury and Hayes Wound up in Bintown Trying to get an education To modulate the status Of my situation Didn't graduate Frustration put me on the road in search of sanctification. I was really good at being young. About guys like me, songs are sung. I can't believe the circles that I run in. The pieces that I swung at, the bells can't be unrung. I was really good at being. Join up with the band Out in Cincinnati Had a bowl of chili With the pimp daddy Learning in the notes A broil up a fatty From a girl in West Virginia On the backseat of a caddy Got a gig in Jersey, so I took that turnpike ride. Met a couple Johns, would call themselves Southside. Tow up the fast lane, that can't be denied. I got some sand between my toes, walking Oceanside. I was really good at being young. About guys like me, songs are sung. I can't believe the circles. That I run in the pitches that I swung at, the bells can't be unrung. I was really good at being young. You couldn't tell me nothing, 
I wasn't gonna learn for myself Bang around Manhattan trying to find a record deal Got hot up on some mushrooms with a cabbie at the wheel Smoked the joint Molivi's office that had to be concealed Cause I'd have took a beating if that had been revealed Everywhere I went, my eyes was open and wide For every life I had, there was a cheer I cried Lost more than I won, but I never lost my pride Now I wouldn't trade a minute of that crazy ride I was really good at being young About guys like me, songs are sung I can't believe the circles that I run in The pitches that I swung at The bells can't be unrung I was really good at being young I was really good at being dumb. I am dumb! Uh, pretty cool tune, right? You know, uh, doing things the way we're doing them here now, it gives you the chance. You know what I always hear on that song? Right. I hear Stevie Wonder playing a chromatic harp solo. Oh, yeah. To that. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, about uh, the other day, the best singer that I've ever heard, mm -hmm. and I think it might be Stevie Wonder, might be able to, might be the best singer of them all. For some reason, I, I was thinking about that, and 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 you know who another singer that came up to me that I thought was just so effing outstanding. Let's go back to Texas. Delbert McClinton. Oh, yeah. yes. Absolutely. I mean, what a soulful singer this man was. Man, the, I a little know, bird, a little bit. A little bit of bird. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bird was in that league of, yeah. of the world's great singers. Yeah. Um, he, I don't know if you guys know this, but when Delbert McClinton was a little kid, he played harmonica on that song called Hey, Hey, hey Baby. By Bruce Chanel or something like that. He played harmonica on that record and went to England with him and ended up teaching John Lennon how to play harmonica. <laughs> Did you know that, Tom? It sounds like I'm making that shit up. <laughs> but I ain't. And so when Delbert was a little kid, I think even before he started his with the singing, and really good songwriting. He's he's written some great songs. Um he taught John Lennon how to play harmonica, and then John Lennon did Love Me Do. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. I think that's a true story. If, if it ain't, it's a great one, even if it ain't true. But but I believe it's true. That's Delbert McClinton, man. I mean, yeah. what a... Uh, Two more bottles of wine is right. Delbert McClinton. Right. I, ju I just heard Cheryl Crow yeah. sing that with... Uh, how about Cheryl Crow? Oh, yeah. That bitch sings her ass off. She really does. She's she's a really one of the last really cool rock and roll people, right? Mm -hmm. Cheryl Crow, man. She, I mean, she puts the meat on the table. How you doing? Uh, I had some other songs I wanted to play. We got twenty minutes to oh, play them, have... man. Okay. Uh, let's go and do. We didn't do. Uh... No, we didn't do it. This one here, wrote it in the past few years, probably about in the past three or four years. And at different times, I've learned it. 
And I never, but I put it. It's like a, it's like a girl that bought a dress that she never really wore it. <laughs> it just hung in the closet all those years, <laughs> waiting for her to grow into it. Put a little meat on her titties. I mean, uh, <laughs> Tom, I didn't say that. What I just said, I didn't say. Security. <laughs> I just, I just, what I just said, I did what no, I, just, I didn't, I didn't say nothing. what I just said. I didn't hear nothing. Um, but anyway, this song here, um, it's been sitting around for a few years, and I would love to uh, get into this big studio room here and cut the shit out of this with a baritone saxophone, uh, a couple of singers, uh, piney, a couple of slides, slipping tuned. Oh, you'll see what I'm saying. And you, you've, you've heard us do this before, but uh, let's try it again. This thing called All She Wants to Hear is the Blues. And uh, see what we got. You feel that? How simple? Boom, boom, boom. That's what the bass drum's playing. She had men, plenty of them, but things never seemed to work out. Took on a woman one time, back in college, she was living wild. She might have had a threesome or two, but all she wants to hear is the blues. She had money. Lots of her when she married up with a man He had a woman that he kept on the side And him and that bitch Just up and ran to go to money with him too Now all she wants to hear is the blues Yeah, the man and the moan and the band and the bone and A troll and a show and a saxophone boom, boom, boom. Big smile on her face She found religion for a minute And she found something else Come in a bottle, hold on a glass And it ain't no goddamn good for your health After she's had a few All she wants to hear is a blue Right around a little bit, like this here. Swing it to and fro, back and forth. How you like that shit? She had a daughter, looked just like her. Oh, you should see that girl dance. She had an order for we one of them young fellas. Even stands a chance. On them fancy shoes. All she wants to hear is the blues. Yeah, the swing and a sang and the guitar's ringing. Gets you to feeling alright. And the time I know the ramen is so sublime. I keep her on the floor all night. And all she wants to hear, just like her mother dear. All she wants to hear is the blues. Hear the blues. Yeah, baby. All she wants to hear is the blues. Because you know why? It snaps her girdle. It rings her gadutch. <laughs> And makes her go, ba boom, get over here. I want to dance with all of y'all. 
dancing? How about dance? Who invented dancing? Music plays and then people rise up from their dank, motionless bodies. The music brings out the motion in the body, the motion of the ocean. And then people start to move in it and feeling it and grooving it. And that's how babies are made, man. I mean, that's, how, that's, that's why life goes on. That's what does it. That's what loosens things up. That's what opens up the highway. I happen to be the manful handful, the beauty on duty. One wop with the bop. <laughs> the greaser who's a lady paliza. The thrower and the show with a high priest from the Church of Rock and Roll on the east side of what? Pittsfield, Pennsylvania. And I come in the room, I come busting in. Oh! There's a man on deck. And he don't give a heck. Because he's a comma and he's a shower. And he's a bringer! I have my friend Tom here. Tom brought the cutest. Uh, he brought a sure. keyboard that is so small it could be mistaken for a harmonica. key. That's, yeah. It, it's, um, it's, it's, how big is that keyboard? It's about the size of a harmonica. It's cool as hell. I it is it. cool. I love it. It was nice to have the accompaniment on oh, um, right. over said and done. Yeah. How about my friend Harold Bottoms, the proprietor, proprietor, Please. proprietor of Double H, Harry's Hideaway. Mm. You know, they have the monogram uh, <laughs> hankies. When it's, if you have a, mon a hanky that says Double H on it, you're in a very, <laughs> excuse me, a very <laughs> exclusive club. That there's only a, a couple of folks that understand what goes it's on? Only a couple of folks are allowed in. Yeah, you you know, not everybody's allowed in. No, it isn't an open allowed. gate. It's not an open gate, no. <laughs> the gate swings, <laughs> but it's not an open gate. Uh, we have time for another song or, song or two, right? Three tenor. Ten. Uh, what can we try? I don't know. I have some wonderful numbers. Last week, we talked about Jimmy Sapp. Yeah. Uh, how cool was it to um, know this guy? For me, it was the ultimate. And I had mentioned that Jimmy Sapp has a song called uh, I Love Pittsburgh. And it's, and it's written in the tradition of the great 1940s songwriters of which I study, my hobby is studying the music of the 1940s. The, 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 you know, like Rod Stewart, he did his American songbook bullshit. I study that shit too. And uh, you know what it does? It puts musicality into your gourd. Because the way those guys wrote and the way those guys connected chords together was the exact opposite way that the grunge movement pushed music down people's throats. In the 1940s, they didn't do that. You know what they did? They finessed you. Finesse. They touched the notes and the chords together and the melodies and they all made perfect sense if you knew what the F you were doing. And that's something I've been studying for a few years. For whatever the hell reasons. I even forgot what song I was going to play. I'm not, hey, I'm over here not bagging myself. Uh, Jimmy's song, I Love Pittsburgh. Jimmy's brother-in-law, Bill Hillgrove, and I got a chance to exchange a few phrases on Fotchbook, and he is in favor of um, my concept of making I Love Pittsburgh the song of the city, and he mentioned that we have to figure out how to get that onto Mayor Peduto's desk. And so, and then I lost track of him, but I have to get back on it. And everybody else out there should be thinking about it too. If you know Mr. Peduto or any of the uh, officials downtown, tell them about the song, I Love Pittsburgh by Jimmy Sapp. It should be our city's official theme song. I have a song called Pittsburgh PA that I don't believe should be our city's theme song, but I'm gonna play it for you right now just because we're talking about songs about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Pillsburg. I was called Pillsburg. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm going to put an L in there. Pillsburg. We used to have a, Shook used to have a friend named Jim. And we used to always call him <laughs> Jim. Jim. Because that, we used to talk, in the 60s, he said, hey, Jim. I don't know where it came from, but that's how guys would talk. Don't jam me up, Jim. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's how shit happens, you know. Like it's it's all East Side. Um, let's try this piece. A thing called Pittsburgh, PA. I was born here. I'll probably die here. Of giving my life to this town And after all these years Seem like I'm still Being kicked around I come up the hard way, hard way. Pittsburgh, PA I found some work here Doing my own thing Thought everything was on time I looked around to see where I stood And I was at the back of the line Yeah, I found out the hard way, hard way Pittsburgh, PA Here in Pittsburgh, PA We've got the powers to be Scratching each other's back Looking down the Nova Mazeroski Way. Yeah. On opening day of Pittsburgh Pirate Baseball season in honor of the most honorable beer company, Iron City Bia. Two syllables. Bia. You know, beer. You can say it that way if you want. But if you want to show it respect. Bia. Two syllables. Give it an extra. Uh, Bia. Ask him. Well, Harry wrote the book. <laughs> you know, I'll Teach You to Drink. It was one of the uh, great books. For, was that the first book? No, Wake Up, It's Happy Hour. Wake Up, It's Happy Hour was Harry's first book. It was a coffee table <laughs> book. Uh, quick read. But it, it was... Uh, it taught you about uh, how to drink successfully. You know, it asks at the, be at the beginning of the book, says, do you want to drink? And if you say yes, and it says, well, you say you want to drink, but do you want to drink successfully? If you're going to drink, be a successful drinker. In other words, make sure you accomplish what you wanted to accomplish when you put the nectar to your lips. Make sure you look at the can and see the alcohol content. 
And if it isn't up to, put it back. Put it back on the shelf. I'm proud of you, Norman. You did read that book. <laughs> I have read Harry's book. I mean, what do you mind? Are you kidding me? I'm lucky enough to know an author. <laughs> as, as I slough. I'm not <laughs> you know, it was never a good idea to get close to me when I'm working. <laughs> no COVID here. Huh? They say Norman spit on them. I never spit on people. I slobber. And, and most of the people that come, they, they know me. They know I would never spit on another human being because you know why? I got respect. I got respect for everybody, for every living thing. That's it. Got a little Buddhist in you. I can't kill a spider. I want to relocate it. I had one. I named it Boris. Left it, left, left it in his thing. He was he was doing work. He was living with you, right? He, was, he he got away and wanted a new thing. He left his area, and, he, and that was that. I had to get him out there. But when he was working, he was, he was, he was earning what he was he, what he was doing, earning his keep. That's what he was Spiders, doing. man. You know, stink bug. You know, I have a stink bug relocation program that I've been involved in for years. Uh, I don't know. That's in mine on a cruise. Hey, we got time for another song, you right, got Tom? Three minutes. Oh, we got three minutes. Make it a short yeah. one. <laughs> oh, if we go. I'd like to send this out. Paul Wargo. Who I love very much. He fell in love with our dog Lucy. And he didn't like female dogs. And he didn't like little dogs. But that Mexican bitch, she broke him down. My father. Pure of heart stood by me from the start, and I miss them both. She said, Been gone, left me here, keep an arm. See you when I get there. Think I can pay the fare. Heard it's nice up there. See you when I get there. Friends of mine, as good as gold, had angel wings, truth be told. Was bound for glory, touched by the hands. Now they're living in a promised land. See when I get there, I won't know what to wear. I'll just pull up a chair when I get there. Where I'm going, I'll be home. No longer will I roam. Life I lived wasn't by the book. I got ghosts back there. Tree is shook. Dungeon door, pearly gates. <laughs> Call my name, we'll clear my slate. I'll see you when I get there We'll have a grand affair Get on a chair when I get there See you when I get there We'll throw our hands in the air Like we just don't care When I get there See you when I get there Well See you when I get there when I get there, well.